Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second in our series of three revision sessions focusing on the, the market structures, monopoly yesterday, oligopoly, and contestable markets today. We're going to look at those three key market structures and do some revision with each other. If it's okay with you, 25, 30 minutes of revision, key diagrams, key application, important devaluation. And judging from yesterday's session, those of you watching it live, well, many of you were here. A uh, huge amount of people watching it to replay some great, great contributions, students absolutely smashing and uh, right up for the exam on Monday. So today we're going to focus on oligopoly. This is what we're going to cover. So it's coming up on the screen now. We'll look at some topical examples of oligopoly. We'll talk about the, in the importance of interdependent decision making, perhaps the most important word in the entire topic. We will go through the kink demand curve model. I'm conscious that about half the students here today uh, are at Excel. Now you don't technically need it, but my students certainly use it and you'll be credited for the kink demand curve. We'll say a little bit about non-price competition, which is an essential feature of oligopoly. We will definitely have one example of game theory, which you all need. And then we'll finish off with a bit of work on, on price collusion, the diagram showing joint profit maximization. As always, as always, can we uh, post comments in chat, credible comments, great, great ideas to help the group uh, as we head towards our papers. Here we go, let's work through oligopoly. So oligopoly is of course imperfect competition. Um, duopoly is part of it, so you can link the two together. Very high level of market concentration and a market structure that, I love this definition by the way, it's defined by, by, by not how many firms are in the market, for example, it's defined by the day-to-day -day decisions of the firms within a defined market. That's quite important. As we said in the previous video on Monopoly, Monopoly power depends in part on how you define the market. Okay, that's a key definition. It's moving on. Just a few examples of, of, of oligopoly that you may or may not have covered. Uh, financial services, banking can come up on, on the papers, of course. This is the market for mortgage lending in 2020. And you can see that Lloyds Bank is the biggest firm. But actually, the relative um, spread of market share is relatively even, certainly for the top six or seven. If you add together the five, five firm concentration ratio, you get 64%. And as you know, if anything more than 60% is an oligopoly. Nationwide in there, by the way, it's Britain's biggest building society. And of course, Santander, a great example of a Spanish bank that has made significant inroads into the, into the UK. Barclays Bank, by the way, of the UK banks was the only bank that didn't receive a bailout in the global financial crisis. So mortgage lending, good example of, a, of an oligopoly. And here's another another example, the courier services. Now, I just have a feeling that something like letters, Royal Mail, that kind of stuff could well feature. You see, 20 years ago, the Royal Mail had a pure monopoly effectively on letters and parcels, but then they deregulated the industry. And of course, now we've got a whole host of companies. I mean, there are literally thousands of parcel companies, particularly in and around the cities. But if you add together the market share of the top five, you get 76%. And of course, Royal Mail technically is a working monopoly within an oligopoly. My favorite business, DPD, they do all the two-to-two -two deliveries and they are quite brilliant. And that, moving on, uh, is a, uh, I think the key thing there is the parcel services sector is best described as a contestable oligopoly. Now, by the way, I love this phrase, a contestable oligopoly. So it's contestable in the sense that there's loads of small carrier firms, loads can and do enter the market, often localized delivery firms. But actually it is an oligopoly. You've seen that with the data. You've got a lot, small number of very large scaled businesses. And if you think about that for a second, if you've got, if you've got competition and the economies of scale, you could make a case for saying that the contestable oligopoly is the optimum structure from a consumer welfare point of view. Okay, another example is cinemas. If you're looking for a worked example for your notes, here are the top three, View, Odeon and Cineworld. By the way, Cineworld also owns Picture House. So Cineworld is the leading company in the UK with 25%. But again, top five firms have three quarters of the market. It's clearly an oligopoly. So there are some examples of, uh, of oligopoly for you. Mortgage lending, parcels and cinemas. Now the next key bit is the concept of interdependence. On Monday, if you're writing an essay, a question on oligopoly, you must, please, you must use the word interdependence behavior. 
And what that means is that one firm's output decisions, pricing, investment decisions, they're influenced by the likely behavior, the likely reaction of the rival firms. And therefore, that's uncertain, isn't it? You don't know how the firms are going to behave. So in oligopoly, there is by definition a lot of uncertainty, and that makes the model difficult to predict. Now, moving on, what are the key objectives of firms? So the, the model that you, you have in oligopoly depends in part on the objectives of the firms within it. Uh, and all behavior by businesses is strategic and will depend on the objectives. So businesses typically are profit seeking rather than profit maximizing. Most firms in an oligopoly are aiming to satisfy, so it's satisfactory return on capital. But actually point two is as important. They're looking to protect the market share from established competitors and also from new entrants. They're looking to grow their user base. So I want to focus on this for a second or two. You've probably come across marketing economies of scale. It is far cheaper to sell to an existing customer than it is to sell to a new customer. So if you can build your user base of, of people you've sold products to, you can achieve a significant scale economy. And of course, the others, point four, uh, to achieve one of those barriers to entry. But fundamental, fundamental is reacting to the decisions of rival firms, both potential and actual. Okay, so that's key aspects of competition in oligopoly. Uh, I'll pause here in case there's any really good questions coming through. Um, uh, just looking at the chat window. Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes, if that's okay with you, uh, by looking at the kinked demand curve model. Let's work it through together as a group. The kinked demand curve model is an analytical approach that you can use when thinking about interdependent decision making. Now, crucially, not all exam boards require the kinked demand curve. But my suggestion is that you should definitely use it and you would undoubtedly be credited if you draw it accurately as part of your uh, analysis. Uh, question coming in, can a firm be a profit maker and oligopoly, a profit maximizer? You can, of course, you can maximize profits in any market structure. My argument was that in an, oligo in an oligopoly, market share uh, is as important of revenue as as important as pure profit. Ismail asks, what's an example of a contestable market? I'm doing a live stream on contestable markets at 4.30 today, straight after this presentation. Now, if it's okay with you, let's work through the kinked demand curve model sequentially. I'll take it, take it through with you line by line, just that we can, uh, we can uh, revise it together. So down to behind the kinked demand curve, there's two demand curves, one's elastic, one's inelastic. So if you draw the elastic first bit, now if we add in now the inelastic section, in the exam, make sure there's a clear difference in the elasticities. Okay, so moving on to the next build. Uh, there was a kink in that demand curve. That, that's the firm's average revenue curve. And, uh, you know, we don't know where we at, why we start there, but let's assume we settle at that price and that quantity. Now, if firms raise their price, uh, the rivals are assumed not to follow a price increase because they want to gain market share. And if you raise your price and others don't, you're going to lose sales. And if, price, if demand is price elastic, you're going to lose revenue. Okay. For a fall in price, our assumption is that rivals do follow you. If, if you cut your price, they'll follow you. And of course, you'll sell a few extra units, but you won't sell as many or as much more as if you cut your prices and others haven't followed suit. So the assumption is if, you've, if you raise your price, demand's elastic. If you cut the price, demand is inelastic. As a result, at that price and quantity, which we'll draw in for you now, at the price and quantity Q1 and price P1, there is a, there's a difference in the elasticity of demand uh, according to this kinked demand curve model. Okay, so uh, at this price, P1, and I'll put Q1, any price change leads to a fall in total revenue at that kink. Let's put that into our analysis there. Any price change leads to a fall in revenue. And indeed, adding to that, moving on, prices can become sticky at this point uh, once they become settled at that price. And as a result, firms may decide to focus instead on non-price competition. Well, that's the average revenue curve. Let's put the marginal curve in on the next build. And of course, marginal is twice the gradient, half the average revenue curve. So there's the marginal curve that goes from a price to rise above P1. But then there's a gap in the MR, if we draw that one in, 
marginal revenue will lie actually below the x-axis for the demand curve below price p2 and that suggests that if it's, if it's below the x-axis a fall in price will cause revenue to fall as a result if we then put in a marginal cost curve here it comes p1 q1 might also be a profit maximizing equilibrium so you've settled at price p1 q1 and it might actually be a profit maximizing point and interestingly just on the next build if we then add a change in cost a rise in marginal cost might not cause a change in the firm's price Let's take a moment here that's the kink demand curve diagram that i would draw on the exam on monday it suggests and this is quite an important point that firms once you've settled on a price you may have little incentive to change it. And as a result, you might compete more instead in terms of non-price competition. Okay, that's the King to Market model. Uh, here we go. Olivia says, does the marginal revenue curve have to become negative immediately after the King? Or is that just a coincidence? Great question, Olivia. My uh, instinct is that you should try and draw it negative because then that would suggest that the price fall below P1 uh, does cause total revenue to fall? Great question. Uh, it may well be the Nash equilibrium in game theory terms. You have no incentive to change your price. Took a photo in Sainsbury's the other day. Let me just show it to you. Uh, some people talk about, uh, um, I think it's coming up on the next slide, actually. Here we go. Some people talk about tacit collusion and price matching. Um, if Aldi cuts their prices, do Sainsbury's follow them down? And often that is the case. This is the stuff in Sainsbury's. Well, two things. One, there's actually some product on sale, which is which is remarkable. But secondly, congratulations, Aldi. When you've got the major supermarkets obsessed with price matching your products, then you know that you're making a difference in this market. Worth it, an example worth thinking about. Okay, so moving on. In oligopoly, non-price competition is particularly important. So when prices become sticky. Uh, they've settled at a certain equilibrium we expect to see and often do see widespread and intense non-price competition so some examples of non-price competition let's just think about them and you'll have your own examples but let me just throw some your way so the pace of innovation is crucially important particularly in, in digital uh, markets and things the quality of service is vital including after sale service offering things like free upgrades to uh, to customers uh, is important uh, a lot of businesses of course use loyalty schemes exclusivity um, they spend heavily on branding advertising and they offer sales promotions which aren't necessarily built into the price but things like free shipping guaranteed next day delivery all that kind of stuff for the exam on monday just make sure you do have some good examples of non-price competition and here's a chart which i think would be amazing application uh, for your exam what we've shown here is the this is, these are the biggest advertising spenders in the UK during the pandemic year of 2020. And just maybe worth adding one or two uh, things to your notes here that um, uh, obviously the government was the biggest advertiser in 2020, Public Health England and, and the government, £250 million spent on advertising, much of which related, of course, to the pandemic. But have a look at those companies there, Unilever, Sky, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Tesco, uh, L'Oreal, they are all basically in oligopolistic industries. So Unilever spending nearly three million pounds a week in advertising just in the UK for their products. The heavy advertising spend is a classic feature of oligopoly and worth mentioning in your exam. Great application. And if it's okay with you, uh, we're more than halfway through. I'm just going to crack on. We've got two more things to look at. Let's spend a little bit of time looking at game theory. At Excel students in particular, you just need one example, one example that you know works for you in the exam of, uh, of a game theory, a prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix. So I'll share one with you in the next couple of minutes. Um, okay. Oh, no, asked a question. No, it says, could you use the government spending for theme one and provision of perfect information? You could indeed, actually. Heavy spending by government uh, is, yeah, actually, can we go back a slide, Jim, to that, to that, uh, to that um, information? Fantastic question from Noah. Uh, yeah, non-price competition. So the UK government spent £245 million in 2020. That's a fantastic bit of information. Great if you get a question on information failure. Vaccines, for example. Thanks for your question. I appreciate that. Let's work through together a simple game theory example. So for the purpose of A-level economics, 
you need a payoff matrix. Now for this example, which we'll work through, it's coming up on the screen now. Uh, we will assume that this game is a one-shot game, which means that the decision on whether to raise or lower the price is made once only. And we don't need to think about what might happen in, in, in the future. R tiny, tiny example, but so important. I've actually labeled it top left there. When you draw your, or you write your pricing game, Prisoner's Dilemma out on the exam, a lot of people forget to put in the top left what we're measuring. You know, is it revenue? Is it market share? So I, norm I normally use expected profit because that's quite a nice proxy to use. So you have two firms, firm A, firm B. Firm A is on the left, uh, firm B is on the right. And they have to decide whether to charge a low price or a high price. Okay, so in theory, of course, the Nash equilibrium, if we move to the next slide, is for them both to charge a lower price. It's the dominant strategy for both firms to charge the low price. If firm A, for example, charges a low price, they either get £12 or they get uh is it seven either way uh it's better than raising price in which case they get 10 or they get three so that's the dominant strategy for firm a it must also be the dominant strategy for firm b because it's a symmetrical game so in this situation both firms dominant strategy is to lower the price and they both make a profit of, of seven million pounds each however moving on if they colluded together they would both make a profit of 10 million pounds each, okay? And we call that joint profit maximization. If they both agree to raise the price through price fixing, price collusion, they make a higher profit each and collectively, they make the highest profit possible. Okay, so, however, let's agree, let's, let's assume they agree to collude. If both firms agree to collude and charge a higher price, moving on, then each firm, has an incentive to cheat or renege on the agreement by just undercutting their rivals. If, if, if firm B charges a high price, for example, a firm A will charge a low price, they'll make 12 and they'll cut the profit for firm B. And likewise, in which case one firm cheats, it's in the other firm's interest to cheat. And we end up on the next slide with a, an, a back to the equilibrium of seven, seven. Now this simple pair of matrix is all you need for A level to get a top marked, all you need especially at Excel students. The implication of this, of course, is that firms have an incentive to collude, but that collusion can break down because the pursuit of rational self-interest uh, leads to an outcome which is not optimal from the point of view of both firms together. That was a little look through game theory. Okay, moving on. In reality, of course, if you're looking for some evaluation, it's very difficult for firms to know what the payoffs might be. So very hard in oligopoly to make accurate predictions because of the uncertainty. And crucially, this is where you can drop the assumption of rational behavior. Game theory does assume that businesses are rational profit maximizers. Of course, they may not be. Typically, entrepreneurs are risk takers, prepared to gamble, make, maybe make a loss. Other firms, perhaps managerial driven, established firms, they may be much more risk averse, particularly during a recession. So be aware of the game through example, but also be able to uh, evaluate it. Okay, so cocktail to finish with, and then we're done. And hopefully a nice, useful 25 minute session for you on game theory. Let's look at cartels. Everybody always mentions OPEC. I would never mention OPEC, it's boring. The most exciting cartel in the world by some distance is the Quebec maple syrup cartel which controls something like 97% of the maple syrup produced. Um, it's, it's phenomenally important. 13,000 producers, 8,000 enterprises, 133 million pounds of maple syrup. Interestingly, if you're interested in markup, the price of maple syrup is by most estimates, 25 times the marginal cost of making it. So cartels can make some serious money. Let's have a look together how Oh, some other examples sorry, of cartels. So price fixing in the cargo sector, KLM, fine there. Stage agents of the UK, fine for uh, fixing minimum commission rates. There's lots of good examples you can find, especially from the competition of market authority. Okay, let's just look at the price collusion diagram. Again, let's work through the build. So if you're going to draw a cartel diagram, you'll need two diagrams. On the left-hand side of the cartel, on the right-hand side, um, pardon me, a representative firm that's a member of the cartel. 
So let's take the left hand side first, where the industry supply meets industry demand. Uh, the next slide, we get the competitive price and output. The key thing is the, the market would set a competitive price of P1. However, the cartel is aiming to maximize joint profit. So the output will be lower if we draw up to the demand curve on the next slide and draw across, we then get the cartel price. So on the left hand side, the competitive price is P1. Okay. The cartel will squeeze supply, drive the price up to the cartel price. And that becomes the cartel price, which each individual member has to accept. So we draw across from left to right, as you can see. Thinking back to our game theory example, everybody, that will be charging a high price, high price, top left. That then becomes the, sorry, that then becomes the price for the cartel. Effectively, they'll be selling all units at that price. So therefore, on the next slide, that means that the average revenue will equal the marginal revenue at that price. Okay. And as a result, the cartel can make a profit. How much profit they make moving on uh, depends on the output they've been given. And of course, in a cartel, they allocate the output. The x-axis, by the way, in the left-hand diagram and the right-hand diagram is not the same. It's not the same scale. So this cartel member on the right-hand side has been given an output quota, a quantity to produce. Let's join the average cost of that output level. The price is up there. The average cost is shown. And therefore, the shaded area shows the profit that that cartel member can make. So uh, collectively, they're making joint profits maximum joint profits individually you can make a profit however just moving on uh, there's an incentive to undercut because although that's making a good profit it's not the maximum profit each individual firm in a cartel could increase their own profits by just expanding outward a little bit and undercutting the cartel price by a small margin and i think if you've understood cartels if you've if you've revised game theory you know that most cartels collapse largely because of overproduction or new firms come in that just undermine the cartel or because somebody blows the whistle on price fixing that's going on. So that was the cartel diagram. I wanted to share that with you. So we've done King de Marker, we've done game theory, and we have done cartels. Three really, really key bits of analysis. Let me finish with some evaluation points. Okay, so four points from me, which I think are really important if it comes to oligopoly. If you're looking for that level five AQA or that level three evaluation for Edexop. First of all, uh, undoubtedly in oligopolies, collusive behavior is common. So tacit collusion, price leadership, for example, price matching, overt is obviously price fixing. So collusive behavior is common, uh, but the Competition and Markets Authority has definitely become much more proactive investigating cartels and issuing large fines. So it's becoming harder to sustain price fixing behavior, especially in a digital age. The second point is that often uh, people assume in oligopoly there's very limited competition. That's not the case, actually. There's often very intense competition, particularly when you have a small cluster of big businesses, you know, big giants, fighting for market share. If you think about the market for sports drinks or whatever it is, uh, protein yogurts, whatever it is, there is genuine competition. In fact, there's probably more competition in oligopoly uh, than in any other market structure. Yes, in oligopoly, the barriers to entry are large. Of course they are, which means that existing firms can make super normal profits in the, into the long run. But that's the key feature of an oligopoly is that you do get smaller challenger brands trying to break into the market, often using a different model. And of course, a lot of students make the mistake of saying that oligopoly is a market where there's only a few firms. There could be thousands of firms in an oligopoly, uh, many of whom are very small, uh, operating you know, behind the scenes, trying to chip away at uh, different parts of the market. As always, and the same as with Monopoly yesterday, the impact of oligopoly on welfare, consumer surplus, etc., efficiency, depends on how well resourced and how strong is the industry regulator. When you have a strong regulator, then you often get some quite good outcomes in terms of welfare and efficiency. There we go. Uh, just got a few seconds left. If there are any questions, 
or, or comments you want to make, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll look at the screen as we do so. Oh, Reese, great question from Reese. Oh, okay, Eddie H, non-price competition, MR shift diagram useful? Yes. Eddie, what I did on the um, on the key diagram um, um, collections, I've done a special video on how to show the impact of advertising on cost and revenue. That would be a great one to use. So thank you for that question. Um, Daniel Piper says, is game theory and the diagram relevant to AQA? I would say definitely yes. Daisy, what industries are evidently active with an oligopoly? I think crucially there, Daisy, oftentimes consumer-facing industries. You think about telecoms, supermarkets, petrol retailing. Basically, anywhere where you've got lots of small firms, but some big firms as well. The hotel sector is another, another good example. Um, yep, okay. Uh, not, don't, have any, don't have any special tips for OCR, unfortunately. Can you use supermarkets as your monopoly, oligopoly, and contestable market? market case study the beauty Javon, of using this is that supermarkets is a, is just about the perfect market structure to use you can indeed use it across all three and i would recommend you do that it's a fantastic one to study even if it doesn't come up you can still use it andrea what are the key things to mention when using the payoff matrix great question key things to mention i think would be first of all uh, there's uh, rational firms tend to follow their own self-interest but that leads to an outcome which is not as good as if they colluded. Uh, top left is better than top right, the bottom right, if you remember the table. But once they go top left and they start colluding, there's an incentive to break the agreement and therefore you, you end up bottom right. So collusion is beneficial, but often that sowed the seeds of its own demise, if that makes sense. Nathan, Nathan asks, do collusive oligopolies have monopoly powers? They're working together. Yes, they do. Great point. In fact, you can make a case for saying the aim of collusion, let's say between the top four or five firms in the market, the aim of collusion is essentially to operate as if they were a monopolist to achieve the joint monopoly profit. And then it's up to them how they divide their spoils. Any more questions coming through? These are great questions. This is an oligopoly is clearly a hugely important um, part of the course, and I'm sure you'll be revising it ahead of Monday. A lot of people, Kazami says, can you wish me good luck for Monday? I want to wish all of you good luck for Monday. I mean, my, my students have been working super hard, and I'm sure you have all been working hard as well. We'll pause there. We've, we're, up to, we're up to time. 25 minutes is up. Our time together. I'm doing another video on contestable markets later on today which hopefully might be really useful for the exam. But thanks for joining me. Hundreds in the live stream today. Stay happy, stay positive, stay curious. Good luck on Monday and see you soon.